Hi, I'm Kenny Bass with Eyewitness News, and this is Beyond the Podium, where we try to go a little bit more in-depth than just sound bites when we're talking to politicians and candidates for office. Joining me is Chris Miller, gubernatorial candidate on the Republican side in West Virginia. We've talked to two of his competitors already. We hope to talk to the uh, fourth Republican in this race shortly. But today, the spotlight is on you. Welcome uh, aboard. Thanks, man. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for being here. Yeah, I, I, normally, I give people a kind of a tutorial on, okay, TV, we've got this camera and this camera. You've been on camera a lot with your advertising, your private business, so I we think you've got this around. handled. Yeah, you know your way around. Yes, sir. Uh, softball question first. Why should West Virginians vote you for governor? Great question. Um, so I'm a business guy, right? I'm not a politician, and we have this incredibly rare window of opportunity in West Virginia where we could accomplish something great, mm -hmm. but we also have a serious set of challenges that we need to make sure and have our best and brightest around us. And it's too big of a risk, and there's too much potential to leave it up to politicians because we've seen what happens over and over and over again when we let politicians involve. They talk out of both sides of their mouth, they say all kinds of things that mean nothing, and then they do nothing. And they're also really, really bad negotiators. And we're in a position right now where we've got serious decisions to make. We got serious deals to cut and we got to have our best and the brightest around. So that's why it's got to be me. I've heard a lot of guys over the years and too many years that I want to reveal say when they are business people or when they come from the private sector into government, into the swamp, as they say, you need to run government like a business. Absolutely. Many people say that's impossible because you have two entities with different purposes. What's your take on that? So I made a career out of buying broken assets, putting all the right people in the right places, and turning the asset to make it churn. Mm. And so that's the same thing when we're talking about the state of West Virginia. We're talking about the government of West Virginia. There are so many little things that we need to do, and it takes the right guy that's the right business mind to get in there and fix it. And look what President Trump did. We literally took a business guy and put him in charge of our country in 2016 and started creating the greatest economy the history of the world's ever seen. So business guys know what they're doing. They, and the most important thing is they know how to get stuff done. So not only are we good negotiators, and we've seen that politicians over time are bad negotiators, but also we understand how to operate with urgency and create speed that makes stuff happen. And so that's the difference. Let me dive into this a little bit more because this topic fascinates to me. Running it like a business, when you say that, if I'm understanding you correctly, it's not necessarily the exact business model, no. but some of the powers and abilities that you bring from the private sector, some of the knowledge that you bring, you apply that to government. Because government's job is not to make a profit. Yes. Businesses are. So you're not talking about it as, to, as treating it like the same entity, but using the skills that you have. Let's define it like this. We are all taxpayers. Mm -hmm. Every single one of us out there watching, you and me both, and we pay, we pay taxes every single year to the government. The government, instead of us being beholden to them, should look at us like valued shareholders. We should be treated like shareholders, and our tax dollars should provide a return on investment and also tangible quality products. And so it's that that we're really needing to get to, hmm. looking at us taxpayers like shareholders and valued customers and do everything that we can with a single-minded focus of making our lives better. And that's the unbalanced relationship that we need to fix. I went to your website, as I've done to the other candidates' websites, and I want to ask you some questions from your website, because if you highlighted them, I figure they must be important to you and your campaign. Mm -hmm. um, run government like a business, of course, was at the Absolutely. top of your list. But you'll say, say, audit every dime spent by the state. The state does have auditors. The state has the legislative auditors, of course, have the, the, the constitutional office of the auditor. Let's factor in 5 to 7% for fraud or theft, okay? And then as a good friend... The, Is that even tolerable? But it happens. I don't think one percent. But that's true. But it happens. Yeah. And you and you, I'm sure, have fraud or theft in your private businesses. We catch it and we put it into it. Exactly. Exactly. But it happens. I mean, you, human nature, Rarely unfortunately. Yeah. Um, when you talk to the legislative auditor, he said, "Here's something that trumps that statistic: more money is lost or wasted in government by stupidity than fraud or theft." So when you talk about auditing every dime, where do you put your focus in? Obviously, it's on keeping everything legal and making sure people aren't getting into the cookie jar. But how do you fix stupidity? Well, it's finding the inefficiencies and holding people accountable to make sure that we provide an optimum machine that runs with the focus of the people that are out there paying the taxes. Mm -hmm. So you can find it. You've got to know where it is. We've got a software system that runs all of our entities. We're able to dial in all the way down into any single business and any single line item, all the way down to a journal entry to understand what's happened. We need to provide that same approach inside of government. So when we're talking about auditing every dime, not only is it no more $300 hammers, because that's disrespectful to you or me who pays taxes to let our money be wasted like that, but it also lets you find out where all the, like you said, stupidity is and the potential fraud, because it's out there as well when you see it with the license plate schemes and that kind of stuff. I was kind of hoping you'd go with no more $32,000 couches, because that, that one hits close to home for me. And by the way, that wasn't illegal. 
That was within is, the purview of the Supreme Court, and yet it happened. Doesn't it fall in line with stupidity? I'll let you yeah, say but, that. But, but those yeah, are it our does. tax dollars. Yeah, they are. <laughs> they, those are our tax dollars that we pay taxes for every single year, and we cannot tolerate them wasting it, especially mm -hmm. when we got like 7,000 kids in a foster care system for the love of Pete. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many other things that that money needs to go to aside from, like you said, $32,000 couches or $300 hammers. It's ridiculous. When you talk about lobbyists in state government, which are an integral part of the process, yeah. they are what they are. Uh, you talk about a code of ethics on lobbyists, which, which could be put on. But then uh, I think you get into the weeds a little bit here, at least where you can explain to me how this would work. You want to ban lobbyists serving in your administration, which yeah. is easy to do. You just don't hire them. But when people leave the administration, you want to give them a, a buffer. Of, they can't immediately go into... Uh, business. Th th this is simply uh, or lobbyists. Yeah, uh, how do you do that? This is simply put: if you are a registered lobbyist, you will not be employed inside of the governor's administration. Okay. Period. The end. That one Plain I got. Simple. That one yeah. I understood. That Plain one. Simple. It's the second one. It's it's how do you keep them from doing something? You have to leave a job to take another job. There's a free market out there. There's mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff that you can find. There's all kinds of opportunities you can use to make money. So no one inside of my administration will then leave and immediately become a lobbyist and experience the benefit of that. That is wrong. That is wrong for the taxpayers. Sign an unemployment agreement, I guess, if they're working with the administration. Yep. Okay. Right, that that answers my simple. question. Yeah. Uh, you talk about term limits as a way to get rid of career politicians. That exists for the office you're running for, obviously, yes, governor. It does not and exist for it. in the legislative. It doesn't exist in the Supreme Court. How do you make that happen when the the people you would be asking to vote on that and eventually go go before the Constitution benefit from being able to stay in office as long as they can? Once again, we all report to the voters, who technically speaking should be the shareholders, and our job is to make sure that they're all informed and know what's going on. And if the voters want us to have term limits in just about every position in government, then by gosh, we should. The other thing, quite frankly, that we should have term limits for are bureaucrats. Mm -hmm. And that's less in West Virginia and more in Washington, D.C., but that's another thing that is a huge roadblock that stops us from getting stuff done. So we should look at that, too. When you look at West Virginia, even though you say it's not like Washington, in some ways it is, because in our experience on this end of it journalistically, we've dealt with people inside of agencies who don't really follow the will and the intent of the administration, or sometimes the legislature, because what they think is they keep their head low. Another governor is coming in and they outlast you. Yeah, they outlast you. So how do you, you get well. by that? They get you in rules, too. Mm -hmm. So you got to have the absolute best people around. And then that's the neat thing about being a leader and being a governor is that technically the governor is the CEO of the state. And his job is to solve problems and report to the taxpayers. So the other way that you did it is, is if you're able to control the funding mechanism, you can find the bad actors and the bad operators and squeeze that funding mechanism. Mm -hmm. So there's ways to do that, too. You talk about a tax cut, and if you were governor, the tax cut, which is being phased in by the current administration, by the legislature, the personal income tax cut would be immediate. It would be gone. Accelerate it quickly. There's the other side of the coin is that's wonderful, but it might be dangerous because the future is unknown. And I've been here long enough to remember when Gaston Caperton had to call a special session before even the session to lay down about $400 you know, million dollars in new taxes. So it's a, it's a cyclical thing. How, much, how confident would you be that with that, with that tax cut that we'd be able to withstand any economic storms in the future? Very, and here's why. If you look at the state revenue right now, a lot of the stuff's coming from this, the coal severance tax. Mm -hmm. And if you look at West Virginia, the other assets that we have, not only do we have a bunch of coal and a bunch of natural gas, we've got an incredible amount of water that passes through our state. According to the Department of Energy, there's more potential for BTU heat production through geothermal heat in West Virginia than all of Saudi Arabia, Arabia's natural gas production. Then you factor in the rare earth element seams that we're discovering here in our state. So there's even more opportunity to expand that and provide a bunch of energy to the rest of the country that West Virginia's got and take advantage of using that revenue generation for creating a more operational state government. So it's about being smart. Do you feel like that you're in a race to out-conservative the other three guys? Because it, it seems like, <clears throat> at least in the debate that I saw, the most recent one you had, when all four candidates were, pleasant, were present, everyone was desperately establishing their... I don't mean desperately because they were desperate, but they wanted people to know exactly what their conservative credentials were. Are you in that, in that race? See, I'm just trying to be me. 
right? And I'm trying to be me, and I'm trying to show that to the rest of the people out there in West Virginia who I am. I'm not like those politicians that are racing after polling data to go, oh, we've got to do this and we've got to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm just out here telling you who I am. And everything that we've talked about the entire campaign trail is who I am. And that's what people in West Virginia are looking for. They're looking for authenticity, and they can smell the difference between a politician that regurgitates polling phrases and a real business guy that is actually speaking his mind. Voters are smart, and they can tell the difference. Let's get into the COVID uh, situation where you called it, and if I'm quoting you correctly, a scamdemic. Yeah. Uh, okay, I just yeah. want to make sure. Yeah. And, you, and uh, everybody has a choice, freedom of choice. Absolutely. Unless you're mandated by a government or military agency during the pandemic that you don't have to get vaccinated. And you Correct. mentioned that you or your family were not. Correct. When, and, and, and I'm not placing a moral judgment on you or value judgment that's your choice, but when did the country, when did it start shifting toward trusting, at least in this particular instance, this vaccine, less than generationally we've trusted measles, rubella, smallpox, things like that? What, what's the, what was the difference for you? I think, I think fear is the one thing. Fear is an interesting motivator that can scare people into doing stuff. And so as soon as that fear stuff starts happening, we all have to sit down and logically go, let's connect the dots here. What's really going on? And when you create a vaccine, which really technically it's not a vaccine like measles or anything else that we've taken in the past. This is something that creates a spike, teaches your body to make a spike protein. Mm -hmm. So it's not the same thing as a vaccine. And there were no clinical trials at all, none. There also is no recourse for the people taking the vaccine to go back against the pharmaceutical companies to then say, you caused me damage or problems with your experimental drug. And so when you start looking at that and you're going, does this really make sense? And then you start reading through, and if you're healthy, you don't have a metabolic issue, you don't have diabetes, mm -hmm. you're not over 65, you really aren't at risk with that. And so when you started reading through all the facts, and then you started looking at the people that were trying to force you to take it, red flags went up completely, and thank goodness they did. And I listened to my wife. I mean, she was the one that did all the research and said, I don't think this is the right thing for our family. And mm -hmm. I was like, okay. I trust you, let's go. And we, we made that decision right there, and as it turns out, you start looking at the health consequences, the fact that there's no recourse, the fact that there are lots of people that are getting sick, you've got a dramatic uptick in myocarditis, you have a dramatic uptick, up, uptick in youth deaths. Like, the things just start telling a story that don't make sense for it to being a safe thing. So I'm glad we did what we did. If anybody else out there did something different, that's their free choice, and I support that completely. But th once again, should they be forcing us to do stuff that they don't know the consequences or the outcomes of? And I just don't think they should. I will, I will at least interject that there were clinical trials, not traditional clinical trials like we've seen previously, but while they were developing the vaccine, there were tens of thousands of people who took the thing yeah, there were. who were clinically tested. And I, you know, I've never been in a pandemic. I wasn't around in 1918 for the Spanish flu, so I don't know how we would have handled it. But so there were, I, I see what you're saying, there weren't traditional clinical no, trials. Weren't. And they weren't lengthened. They, they, they were, were no not. length at all. It was a very, very short period of time, right. so there wasn't even a time for these symptoms to develop. Exactly. So I think the whole thing was just done too fast, too quick, and we don't have all the information even today. We're talking about 2024, and this started in 2020, and we still don't have all the facts. Well, I was an old fat guy, so I took it. <laughs> I, and, uh, and hey, we'll 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 who knows? Just you know? take it. Um, and I'm not saying I'm going to make the right decision or wrong decision for anybody but me. And I don't I even know if I made the right decision for me. But and that's important. What the heck? You know? Yeah, I had the freedom to make that decision. Yeah. Um, let me ask you about vaccines because they were the topic of much conversation in the recent session. Uh, the legislation was passed for more sweeping exemptions, which would be allowed in West Virginia, which traditionally has had very strict vaccine protocols for public school students. Mm -hmm. Where are you on that? Because this is dealing with measles and rubella and things I, that we've been dealing with for, I for think decades. You should have the freedom to choose what you want, but also bear the consequences of it. I mean, my kids are vaccinated, vaccinated for measles. Mm -hmm. We don't get the flu fa vaccine. We've gotten a couple other vaccines. These are traditional vaccines. We know what they are. They're a shred of the virus that's put in your body to let you develop the immune system. The experimental stuff's a different conversation. There are risks when it comes to not taking traditional vaccines because we're seeing an uptick of stuff like measles. Mm -hmm. So just bear the burden to the responsibility of your choices. If you don't want to get your kid vaccinated, don't get your kid vaccinated. But realize there could be consequences. You need to be. You need. Be, you need to make sure and be held accountable for that. Should that consequence include not being allowed to attend public school, where you could put other uh, kids at risk? If you're paying taxes, then that public school belongs to you just as much as it does to anybody else. Okay. You know. Or you could go to a private or charter yeah. school, which and could also, or a, a parochial school, which yeah, also could which have exemptions. You're paying a fee to go there too, though. Let me ask you about your opponents in this race. 
Um, you had the line, I think many people uh, said of the debate that was held earlier this year. I would agree. It was a great line. Uh, Patrick Morrissey made a comment to Moore Capito about um, Senator Capito's involvement in the settlement process and said if he'd have listened to her, it would have gotten less money, et cetera. And you said, and I'll even let you say it. Go ahead. You must not be from West Virginia. Because people from West Virginia know you don't talk about people's mamas. Bang, and that's what you said. That's and um, that, that, to me, that was a double-edged sword because, one, <clears throat> you're right. We, we usually don't. But, two, it's been famously talked about that he is not from West Virginia. He does have 18 years in. He is a three-term attorney general. So, you know, I, personally, I'll give him a break, give him a West Virginia card. But were you also making reference to that, that he did take opportunities to come to West Virginia to, to begin his uh, – move along his political career. Yeah, there, if we're being totally candid and honest, mm -hmm. there's reminiscence of the Rockefeller effect here, which is move to West Virginia, inject yourself in the political system, become successful, and then, you know, go off to Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. you know, which, he, which he has attempted to do by running for Senate previously. Yeah. yeah. And so where's your heart? Where do you want to be? What do you want to accomplish? And at the end of the day, I love West Virginia with all of my heart. I mean, I, I've, I've built a bunch of different businesses. I've got 26 businesses, 700 employees, and I'm going to die right here in West Virginia. I also don't ever want to go to Washington, D.C. You couldn't pay me enough to live in that place. I want to make West Virginia the greatest state in the country, and we have an opportunity to do that. And it takes business guys and hard chargers to be able to accomplish that in the world that we're in because the world's gotten a little crazy around us. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I don't, I don't care about what my opponents say or do. A couple of them are really good people. i got nothing but great things to say about Mac Warner. He's a great guy. But I'm not running to talk about my opponents. I'm running to talk about what I'm going to do. And in the, in the moment there, I had an observation about someone talking about somebody else's mom, and I didn't like that. And so I spoke my mind, and that's what business guys do. We speak our mind. Moore Capito has a different situation than Patrick Morris. He's literally ingrained into West Virginia with his family. Mm -hmm. um, he resigned from his position in the House before the session started to concentrate on the gubernatorial campaign, and Mike Warner criticized him for that, saying it was, it was a quitter. You don't quit something like that. But obviously, Mr. Capito knows his situation and made his decision. Your thoughts about Moore Capito, who has a lineage of public service in his family in West Virginia, famously from Governor Moore, three-term governor, to the sitting senior senator when Senator Manchin leaves. She'll become the senior senator in West Virginia, Shelley Moore Capito. I have a job to do, and my job is to run a state government. And my job is to report to the voters who, technically speaking, should be shareholders. The rest of that stuff, but why you over I'm not him? worried about Why that. you over him, though? Well, because I can do stuff that no one else has done in West Virginia. I can do stuff that no one else in the field has done. If you look at who we're running against, they're all bureaucrats, politicians, and attorneys. And I'm a business guy. And that's the stark separation. The rest of that stuff, I could care less about. Mm -hmm. Seriously. Mac Warner says it's a two-person race. He's eliminated uh, Morrissey. He's eliminated Capito. He says between you and him. Your thoughts about Mike Warner? Obviously, you say you don't care about it, but he is a career military guy. You say you like Mike Warner. He's a good man. Why should they vote for you instead of Mike Warner? Well, the times, they are changing. And we are in a very, very different position right now with the state of West Virginia, where we have an incredible opportunity in front of us and also a serious set of challenges. And I am not going to leave that up to politicians to handle. That's why I'm here. And when it comes to running state government like a business and running a, running a campaign, I'm not going to worry about what the other guys are doing. I'm going to worry about what I'm doing and what needs, to what needs to be accomplished for the people in West Virginia. The death penalty has come up more and more in recent years as the state has gotten a little bit more conservative. It was introduced famously every year by Delegate John Overington, who was a conservative from the Eastern Panhandle for years. Never got anywhere in the legislature, but he introduced it every year. It is getting some traction now. More conversation. You've talked about it, and you've gone farther than some other people by including some other classes, including, I believe you mentioned pedophiles. I, I uh, your pedoph thoughts about the, the possible move back toward the death penalty in West Virginia? There are some heinous people that have done terrible things, and they don't provide a benefit to society. It's pretty simple. Mm -hmm. There needs to be a point in time where that has to be considered. I also feel very, very strongly about this. Pedophiles do not provide any benefit to society. They do nothing but harm and damage to the people that are victims of them, and then they cannot be rehabilitated. I think they ought to be executed. I think we ought to execute pedophiles. And I think that 95% of the parents out there in West Virginia would feel exactly the same way because the most, the most important and precious natural resource that we have are our children. They're the most precious. And not only do we have to make sure and protect them, but it goes back to economy as well because right now, our educated kids 
are the ones that are leaving the state. And for us to fix our state, we have to create an economy that thrives and run state government a bit more like a business to keep our kids here. Because no longer should our greatest export be our kids. It should be our coal, our natural gas, our water, our geothermal heat, and our rare earth elements, mm -hmm. not our kids. You've talked a lot as, as a conservative, and, and if I'm wrong, correct me. But personal choice, uh, personal rights are very important to you. I would, I would imagine that's the way you come across. Um, there was a bill which passed uh, concerning gender. There's been a lot of conversation in the last couple of years about gender rights and transgender people who transition to another gender. How do you marry the freedom of choice aspect of your personality with some restrictive legislation that was put into place by the legislature? And I don't know where you are on that, but I'd like to hear where you are on that. That someone can answer, well, that's a person's right to decide what gender they are, how does it affect you? Is it the areas where it might affect someone else where you would step in? So gender is binary. It's XX and it's XY. Mm -hmm. Now what, what adults do with their own body is none of my business. But when it comes to what our kids experience, we have to protect our kids and I will draw the line there in the sand period at the end. We do not want biological males and biological female bathrooms throughout all of our education system. It is absolute nonsense. And the worst part is we shouldn't let a small percentage of the population through nothing but fanaticism skew and control the narrative and make guys like us literally re-steer what reality is. Reality is reality and is common sense. There are men and there are women and there's XX and XY. It's just that darn simple. Mm -hmm. It really is. Does that translate to sports as well? Absolutely, absolutely. Biological males have different advantages than biological females. Biological females have different advantages than biological males. Just doesn't necessarily match up with the sports world all the time. Do we waste too much time talking about these social issues, talking about things which tend to bog us down when we have other striking and serious problems which are in our face, which are black and white, which are roads and education oh, yeah. and things like that? Can we have a healthy balance between things which are important to many people, but yet also looking at the problems which in fact impact all of us? The most important thing that we could be doing right now is realizing that we have to fix West Virginia's economy to keep our kids here. And we also have to fix West Virginia's economy to avert a financial catastrophe down the road because we've been declining in population and have an aging population. And it's going to create the perfect storm where we have a financial catastrophe. If we start growing our economy and running our government like a business, we can start putting ourselves in a position where we can correct all of those problems down the road. You mentioned the Department of Highways. The Department of Highways is a problem. We're already bonded to the gizzards. The road bonds project, because of the time that we passed it until now, you have higher labor costs, higher interest rates, and higher inflation. We're not going to be able to finish but about two-thirds of that project. That's going to be a problem. We have a bunch of other things we've got to get fixed inside of the state. The education system's rated dead last. Like I said earlier, we've got 7,000 kids in our foster care system. We're also number one in the country in the number of grandparents raising grandkids. Now, you can't tell me that that's a recipe for stability. Mm -hmm. We've got to fix that, and we've got to fix that now, and it boils back down to what West Virginia's opportunity is and what our strengths are. And our strength is the ability to produce an incredible amount of energy. Everything that we do in the future as we grow technology is going to be about power. You have to have power to fuel technological growth. And West Virginia has a bunch of coal, a bunch of natural gas. We have more water that passes through our state than anywhere else. We also have geothermal production availability here that could be off the charts, monstro like monstrous. And we have rare earth elements right here. And when you add all that stuff up, I think we can do two things, Kenny. I think we can make West Virginia the power plant of the East Coast and export our power and also do something similar to what Alaska did and make sure that our people take benefit from that and make West Virginia the state in the union with the cheapest power in the country and use that as the foundation of all of our economic growth and development. Because if we have cheap power, and I'm talking about a 50 to 70 percent reduction, we have something that businesses will want to come here for to begin with. And two, you think about Jim and Susie Adkins and both of them are on Social Security and they're 74 years old, you cut their power bill by 50 to 70 percent, you've done something incredibly impactful for them too. Mm -hmm. And we have the ability to do it because of all of our resources. I have one more big question for you to wrap it up, but I don't want to ignore the fact that you have political lineage in your family as well. <coughs> I your, thought you might bring your, that up. Yeah, I just real quickly, your mother is obviously our... Are you from West Virginia County? Uh, born and raised. 
Yeah. Don't be talking about my mom either. <laughs> yeah, don't talk about my mom. I wasn't saying anything yeah. bad about your mom. Yeah, uh, she's a distinguished <coughs> congresswoman from the first district now. So it and, gives and me so, a, so how does it? How did her decisions and her career and her path serve in the legislature? Did it impact you and your decision to do this? It gives me a little bit of a cheat code because I've grown up and done nothing but be a part of the business world, but I understand how everything works behind the scenes, and that's the advantage. That's mm -hmm. my real secret sauce is that I'm a business guy. I want to get up there and get things done, but I know how this system works. And the thing that I want to do at the end of the day is there are a lot of people out there watching. They don't feel like they have a seat at the table. They also don't feel like that they're really visible. They think they're invisible. And I want them all out there know to watch, that are watching right now, that I'm doing this because I'm gonna give you a seat at the table. And I wanna make sure that you know out there you are not invisible, you matter. And if we do that, then that's how we bring everybody to the table to start marching the sucker in the right direction. I got the first district right, right? They flipped it, because it used to be third. Yeah. I'm old, I have to Sorry. make sure I get it right. Yeah. Now, last question, you mentioned education. Here's a simple question for you, how do you fix it? So, um, <laughs> good, good luck. Yeah, Go. Yeah, right. Fix education. Um, it has to do one with resources. It has to do two with structure. And it also has to do three with, I think we're missing that good old fashioned vitamin L. You know, that love. And kids thrive and learn when they're surrounded by love inside of a room. So we start there and then you build up. There's tons of resources available. The problem is, is that when you've got bureaucrats soaking up all the resources before the money flows into the classroom to benefit the teacher, because we got to pay our teachers more, mm -hmm. we got a teacher shortage. And also, too, to make sure the money flows to the taxpayer who's the customer which is the student and the parent and so if you just take the system and readjust it a little bit you can do all of those things you can pay our teachers more you can make sure the resources flow into the classroom to benefit the kids and you can make sure and provide a great quality product and if the teachers are happy they're gonna go there with love and teach those kids and they're gonna thrive so I'd start there You've done this a little bit already because you're a pretty good communicator, but I'm going to give you a free shot. Why should you win the Republican primary, and why should you be the next governor of West Virginia? Your audience is right there. Well, um, like President Trump, I'm a business guy, never been a politician before, and I think the governor's job is that he is the CEO of the state, and his job is to solve problems and report to the taxpayers, who technically speaking should be looked at as shareholders. In our state, we've got a couple of problems. We've got this good old boy system that's been running our state for far too long, we're basically dead last in just about everything from economy to education. The only thing we're tops in is the number of grandparents raising grandkids. And so we gotta fix that, and the way that we fix that is to create an economy that thrives, to run state government more like a business, and to audit every single dime that we spend. Because if we don't, and we don't start doing this right now, we'll keep having the greatest export not be our coal and not be our natural gas, but be our kids. And it would absolutely positively be the honor of my lifetime to be selected as the next governor of the great state of West Virginia. And I promise you, I will work 70 hours a week, every single week, to make sure that the state of West Virginia not only thrives, but succeeds. We've been let down over and over again by politicians. They're bad negotiators, they waste our tax dollars, and they say all kinds of things and don't generate results. And I'm gonna create a business-minded, results-oriented administration and government that does everything that it can to represent the people, the taxpayers, and to create a system that literally looks at them like shareholders. And when we do all those things, West Virginia can take off and literally take our place in the 21st century emerging economies. And our people, like we are great. Our people are great, Kenny. The people in West Virginia may not realize how great we have been in the past. Our people literally mined the coal that built the steel that led to a victory in World War I. And we mined the coal that built the steel that led to a victory in World War II. And we mined the coal that led to the cheap energy and the greatest capitalistic expansion in human history. We did that. We are capable of doing amazing things. And if we all roll up our sleeves and get focused right now with the people in the state of West Virginia and how great they are, we can accomplish amazing things. So that's why I'm running for governor. I want to be our next leader that takes us into the 21st century, and I will do everything I can to make sure that everybody out there watching has everything that they need to raise their families and keep them right here in the great state of West Virginia. Chris Miller, Republican candidate for governor. Thank you very Thanks much. So much. Appreciate Thanks it. for joining us on Beyond the Podium. Thank you for watching. I'm Kenny Bass. Have a great day.